So let's stop. There we go. Right, well, here we go. We're going to paint a scene of Bagno Vignoni in um, Tuscany. It's standard watercolours and neutral tint. So first of all, we'll start with the drawing. And I'll share the screen now. And I've got a, I've got a, um, a new way to um, share screens with you. So if I can hold the shift button. Okay, so now um, apparently you can increase the size of whichever screen you feel and obviously decrease. <laughs> I think I've got them side by side on my screen at least. And therefore um, I'm gonna start the drawing and it's basic shapes. Now the format for this scene is a square. So what I tend to do when I'm uh, changing format is I just use the masking tape, this simple builder's tape. And I just changed the format. So I'm going to make this a little bit of a square. And because this is our first one for a while, and the focus really is loose brushwork and color, we do have these wonderful um, um, reflections, which will help us to attain the loose brushwork. But if you could just change the format so you've got a nice square, I think that will give you um, a better starting point for the block in. Now, when we recall our um, art training and we think about um, such masters as Paul Cezanne, you'll know that everything in nature can be simplified. So let's start off with the, the first geometric simplified shape, which, um, Perhaps I'll do red. Red's probably a better color for this. I'm going to start off with turning the houses, these are the big shapes, into squares. So if I start with that square there, and um, what I'll do is I'll just um, adjust the microphone there. There we go. So I've got one basic shape. So I can draw that in. And that's sitting on pretty much the horizon line. So that's about halfway, just a little bit below halfway along the page. And by the way, I'm drawing with um, 1B pencil, a HB or a 1B, most suitable. Really, if you start to go a little bit softer than that, it's hard to erase. And I, I tend to draw a little bit darker than you need on your screen, uh, on your page, sorry. And then this square occupies the, above that line, one third to the right. So you could gauge pretty much simply one, two, three, something that fits around about a third and then give yourself maybe for the sky above a small margin, which I would estimate is is a um, is a fifth above the house, which is the square. One, two, three, four. Well, maybe it's not quite a fifth. Somewhere between a quarter and a fifth. Okay. Once you've got that first shape in, then the next shape actually is just as easy. But because of perspective, we could find it a little bit of a challenge. So what I'm going to su suggest you do is abstract in the first instance to a square. So you see, I just took the line of the roof there, just straight across. 
the line of the wall. And I'll take that down to the water line. There is a slight tilt there. To make it easy on yourself, let's just start with that basic square. Now you'll see that that basic square is a little bit larger than the original square. And please, at any point during the, the um, blocking or the drawing out of the um, outline, please feel free to change your shapes at will because your format will dictate whether these shapes fit comfortably. And if you feel that you need to stretch it a little bit or push it back a little bit, feel comfortable to do that because, um, you know, your intuition is always correct. It's always correct. You know, it's that sixth sense that we have. Oh, that's a bit too big. So gradually, as we get further into the drawing, you, you're likely at that point um, to start to, to, to see more accuracy. But in the, the initial blocking, please take it for granted that most of these lines that we're putting in are just um, ideas. They're not the final lines, but some of them may stay, we will see. So I've got the two squares here, this one's slightly bigger. And then I look at the, the gap between the two squares because it has to fit these little outbuildings. Well, that outbuilding there for sure in the wall. And I'm thinking, well, it's a little bit cramped there. So how can I um, comfortably fit that in? Well, there's obviously <laughs> two strategies we could do. We could shrink these boxes a little bit. So I'm going to shrink that one a little bit. And I could open up perhaps the margin here. Maybe it's not quite a square. Maybe actually it's more of a rectangle than I thought. But the format I've, I'm going to try and stick with, I'll just make the squares a little bit um, smaller. So what are we dealing with? Well, if I change my color here to, to um, a bright green, we can see that the space between this box and this box is very close to that space there. So to keep things in some kind of scale and to proportion, that's what I'm going to do. But if I was to measure with um, my paintbrush or my pencil, I would say that this house here is marginally wider than the gap between the two buildings, marginally. So if I take my pencil here and I measure the gap and as long as it's just a bit smaller which it is than this one I'm comfortable with that so that's how I progress now when some of you have signed up for the uh, the drawing class and when we do drawings it, I tend to use a knitting needle to gauge the distances and I tend to be far more accurate with these with those more um, studio-based drawings and paintings. With watercolour, I give myself a little bit of freedom because I tend to paint outdoors mostly. And that's, you know, if you've been on the holidays with me, you'll know that. And therefore, it's more of an Alla Prima-based painting adventure that I'm trying to reconstruct here. I'm trying to keep it more... Um, lively and um, in that way the challenge is slightly different but I still like to keep the measurements as close as I can so this is more of the rule of thumb not very precise I guess but it, it has a certain amount of precision built in because of these basic shapes right so where do we go from there well notice that the water line here is below that's where the reflection of the wall will start to uh, start its journey into the water. The building, therefore, is dipping its toes there. That is slightly below what I've called the horizon or the waterline there. I'm going to call that the horizon. It's not truly a horizon, but it will do for the composition. So I'm going to bring this line, therefore, a little bit lower down. 
like so. And I'm thinking about that tilt there. And I think that that tilt, if it was to represent a moment on the clock, I might see that as 14 minutes past the hour. 14 minutes past the hour. So once I've got that in, now I feel a bit more comfortable that that building is in perspective or beginning to become in perspective. And this watercolour now starts to progress gradually. So I hope that's um, self-explanatory and it's not um, causing problems, but please let me know in the chat if it is. And I'm going to check the chat in about five minutes anyway. But you see here, I can just nibble a little corner there off of that square. And the tilt for that will be probably thinking to yourself that that would be around about nine or 10 minutes past the hour, something like that. Maybe, maybe eight or nine, whatever you feel it is. And as long as it just nibbles that, so you've got a roof line, then we can do the same with the other building here. So we're getting a little bit of specificity go going on in the shape there. This one's more of a like um, an isosceles triangle. So I would say that that tilt coming down is maybe 16, 17 minutes past the hour. Something like that. And I have found that it's um, about halfway along that line that this tilt starts to turn down somewhere there. And of course, because we're using the rule of thumb, as long as it looks okay, which it will, I can assure you, hopefully we're gonna make it look okay, it'll work. So there we are, we've got um, two buildings coming along, but there's bigger shapes to deal with before we go into detail. So whenever, whenever you're uh, creating compositions, I always um, would advise Deal with the big shapes and the smaller shapes will actually take care of themselves. As long as you can give them space to inhabit, it should be fine. So what I'm going to do now is I, I actually think that this reflection is the next big shape. Here, do you see? So luckily for us, it's pretty much a mirror image of the square above. But... I just want to um, give you some insight. I'm across the water in um there's an uh, there's an ancient mill and an ar arcade there. And so these sort of um, arches that I'm standing in is slightly higher up than the water line there. So because of that perspective, the reflection is below my eye. Whenever a reflection is below your eye level, which is most of the time, it is a little bit shorter than the object that is casting that reflection or creating the reflection. Um, and that's just a fact. So you're okay to make it a little bit shorter, um, but if you try to imitate by taking a, a gauge of that and trying to copy it here, you see, too low that would be too low all right so that's good so we've got a shape where the re reflection can inhabit there um where's the next big shape well this could be the house in the middle um but i'm going to wait until i've got these trees in so the trees are pretty big shapes and i'm just going to simplify them at the moment Everything is much better to be simplified. So I'll take a line across, which tries to join most of the information in that corner there to most of the information in the center here. And you'll see I'm creating like a wave, like a graph, like in maths or science, that sort of thing. It's a very simplistic shape and it begins its journey above the house over here. So I'm just hoping I'm giving myself enough margin there. 
I just pull that down. As I said, at any point when you feel like, hang on a minute, I don't quite have enough space, that's when you, you are free to make adjustments. You must do it. It's editing. You've got to do it. So the top of the trees comes above this house here. Then it drops down, pretty much echoing the, sh the line of the building there. So that's good. It's just very parallel. And then when we get to this sort of center point here, then it goes back upwards again after it dips down a little bit. And then it tilts down again to this roof. A little bit of um, space here for the tree behind the house on the right. And then up again. And then outwards now of course if you're comfortable with drawing those tree shapes because they're almost like broccolis or something they're quite you know trees are in the canopy they're always they always tend to be um, convex so they push outwards like these almost like little balls like mushrooms or cauliflowers and if you feel comf comfortable with that then, of course, you can start to shape that. I'll come back to it because there are some bigger shapes out there that I would like to put into my drawing, first of all. Um, so I'll give you a moment to get there. And um, I'll just point out, though, that we do have a reflection over here of this building here. I'm just going to abstract the shape of it because, as you can see, there's a lot more information in that shape than the initial shapes I have given you. And the reason being, um, we're seeing the reflection of the side of the building and the front of the building in this big shape or large shape. So I just... Um, build or draw out a shape that looks something like that and it's it's kind of like a rhomboid shape or something isn't it it's got five sides so that's what's that hexagonal but it's not a pure hexagon is it so you've got a long shape there and then it comes down a little bit and you know that would suffice because that area now can be reserved as a lighter area in the reflection, similarly to this area here. I hope that's making sense and um, it's starting to come together for you. I'll just check on the chat that um, we're okay. Nothing coming in on the chat. So I am presuming, therefore, you're all busy making your basic shapes and probably even going into detail, which is fine. It's your drawing. And I'm just showing you really a classic way in to this composition. And I, I tend to teach like this because it really helps the beginner. And it also helps the intermediate who may have um, got very confident with um, methods which they've created for themselves, but find that there's a wall that they're meeting with certain aspects of the principles, which usually are the placement proportion and perspective issues. So in doing this method I'm showing you now, what happens is you can undo maybe some of the, um, I'm not going to say bad uh, methods because there's no such thing really, um, but you can build more good methods into what you've mastered. Okay. So you see here, I've just created another one of these irregular shapes. It's almost a square, but look, I've already nibbled a bit off. It's almost a rectangle. So I could really simplify it just by building a small rectangle about half the size of this square here. 
sort of half the size rectangle. Maybe you can make it a little bit taller, whatever you feel comfortable with. And then nibble a little bit off on that end over there. And this time the tilt is very similar to that little one we started with. I'll just see if I can get it a little bit closer in focus for you. So I can do that. Might be this. There it might just be the light effect. It's a bit dim in here. Uh, it's just a bit better, I think. So that's about 10 or 11 minutes past the hour. And then before I go into what I would call detail, the last thing I'd like to do is put that um, other area in it, which is the wall here. And you can see that because the wall is a little bit lower down, so this is perspective as well, its reflection it's probably closer, that top of that wall is probably closer to my eye level, because remember I was saying I'm standing underneath a, an arcade and there's a wall there. So the reflection, if you look, it's pretty much very close to being halfway. So that's interesting, isn't it? So I can now draw that square, or rectangle, sorry, over here and notice its position here. So if I just do a little dotted line going up, it's very close to that side of the building, which you could infer begins with the tilt going down because you've got two sides to this building you can see. There's a side here and the front. And it's this front here that we could divide with the line coming down. And that will give you where that wall begins to come out into the water. So that comes out and it goes about halfway along this building here. So again, it's all sort of rules of thumb, but they work because we did the big shapes and now the little shapes are actually starting to take care of themselves. And at this point, the composition is very abstract. It's almost like a Mondrian or something, you know, um, which is interesting. So if I split that rectangle in half, now I know where the wall is and I know where the wall's reflection is. And it's, it's little by little coming together. I'm not going to suggest that any of it is perfect or correct yet, but as we start to hone in the detail, hopefully it's going, these lines are going to present us with the scaffolding we require to um, achieve the, um, the viewpoint that we're experiencing. So that's good. That's all good because it's exactly this way or this method that I use and many artists that I know when we're out plein air painting, because you've got to start somewhere and these basic shapes make life so much easier, seriously. Right, well, we can start to go into a little bit more detail now and for just the benefit of getting into um, the next big shape, which is actually the reflection of this building in the water, I would take a line across, it's pretty much a horizontal line, just like the ridge, couldn't be easier really, but then hor horizontal lines are a challenge. And then we've got this line coming down, which is very much parallel. So we've got a par parallelogram, which is not easy for me to say, a parallelogram, which is really the basic shape of this structure. Now, if your structure does not look exactly like the one in the photograph, but it does look like a structure, well done, because that's what we need. Um, and you'll find that people who visit this location, even the locals, if you get it approximately right and they can recognize it, they'll just go, ah, Bagno Vignoni. They'll know it. So 
this is um, this is an achievement to get to this point or the point we're going to go to. So we have that basic house there. And then now I know that this line comes from the side of the house, joins the wall, which is also pretty much deliberately so. It is a, um, a horizontal. And whenever you're dealing with interesting viewpoints with perspective challenges like this one, it is a perspective challenge. Um, there's always a way of finding a comfortable position, which is easy on the eye, but um, also very pleasant to draw and paint. And I think that this is a good example of that. Right, so what does that give us? Well, that now allows us to find the reflection of this building below the wall. So we need another little square and this is the one I'm going to be drawing next. And you'll, you'll notice that that's the roof there that's reflected here. So even though you have a bit of a broken edge suggest, suggested by the movement in the water, it's very similar to the shape above, but slightly smaller. And of course it is below mirror image to some degree. And this little line that goes across here, excuse me, it is just a bit maybe above the line of this reflection here. So if you're if you're now struggling because you've got, ah, that line's not quite right, it's too high, then you can squeeze things and push things and stretch, make it comfortable for you. Artists do that because um, you know, when you join it, when you find a scene like this and you're inspired to paint, you may well only have an hour, two hours max to paint. If you've got three hours, that, that's brilliant, but it's usually a short period of time. So you've got to sort of get these constructs going quite early on to give you time to focus on the painting. Right, so there we are. We have all our big shapes in pretty much. We've got the reflection of this building. We've got the reflection of the shed, the um, annex, whatever there. We've got the reflection of the wall and the wall itself. We've got the large building and its reflection. What are we missing? Well, we are, apart from detail, of course, we're missing the reflection of the trees. So the canopy of the trees does feature in the um, painting. Notice I'm just brushing off the eraser burrs because they do make a mess of your paper. So what does that look like then? Well, we can take our cue from these, um, if you still have them, if you've gone into cauliflower shapes, fair enough. But if you still have the, the um, graph lines like I've got, I can follow my eye down and see where that change occurs. And it's about there. I know it's below this shape here. So now I've got a tilt which sort of comes out to about there before it changes its direction. Now in the tree, it goes upwards to the right. But of course, in a reflection, it will go downwards to the right because it's inverted. Now, it's not quite this point here, the peak of that shape. It's not quite as high as those ones up there. So in a reflection, of course, those high ones, well, they're not actually on my page. They go a little bit further down. So I don't see them, so that's good. But this one I do see. This one is lower down. And of course, because it's lower down, it's slightly further up the page. So it's a good left brain, right brain exercise, actually. Um, inverted inversions from reflections um, and my experience in watercolors is you can be quite loose with it again even though I've got a different tilt there because the water moves 
it, that that can move a foot over here or a foot over there it doesn't really uh, make much of a difference in fact sometimes if you get it a little bit wrong it looks more right and that sounds absolutely counterintuitive but with movements in water it's very often the case so try not to make it an identical mirror image therefore and it'll work and uh, that's easier than making it an identical mirror image so we get it we get um, an easier time of it so there it is that should work so i've got a couple of little peaks just i've got a couple of little peaks here um and i hope that's uh, helped you to map out your basic shapes because now i'm going to just check with you you're okay before we go into detail because this is really um the first stage of the drawing complete we have our block in next we go into a little bit of the detail um but i have to say with watercolor a drawing does not have to be anything more than an outline that declares the boundaries for our colors and our edges that's very important because Otherwise, we may dr draw too much. We may draw the unnecessary, which takes time. And therefore, we're not actually um, enjoying the, the painting. We're doing drawing. So I'm just going to um, pause the video there because this is a very good time just to see everybody's happy with what I've been talking about for the last half an hour plus. So I pause. Share the screen with you or both. Here we go. So at this point, we're ready now to go into detail and um, well, with detail, <laughs> you know, there's no rules to painting and drawing, but I tend to start with the big shapes again, the biggest details first. So what's the biggest detail? Well, I, I would say this, um, well, that roof, but I've established that. Then it's between this roof and that roof. But I think this roof here is probably just a little bit marginally bigger. So I'll put that in. Mine seems to be tilting down, so I just change its tilt a little bit. So correct your tilts as you go. Um, the roof over here, well, we have this downwards tilt here for the side of the building, but then of course you've got the side of the top of the roof you can see. So give yourself a narrow amount of parallel line from the ridge of the roof to the well it's where the the end of the roof sits on the wall plate and then this is a, a little tilt because sometimes you see a small very small in this case slither of the other side of the roof which usually is a little bit of a parallel line again but it will emerge a little bit further along and out from the footprint of the building because obviously the roof tends to overhang. Definitely in these old buildings in Italy, for sure. So there is two details. Now there is chimney here and here and there's no reason why you couldn't just get straight into those chimneys. Please feel free if that's how you wish to go. But I see the next big detail for me is the wall, this wall here. It seems to come out, or at least for whatever reason, butts onto the building here. So this shed seems to be linked there. 
to the wall and that wall drops down which is nice that's a, lo a lovely feature as well just a bit of variegated depth to the wall so i just bring it along and then it suddenly drops down and there we are i have a wall in front of the house which is good now it may not be exactly where it needs to be might be a little bit higher or lower i'm going to see because i know, need to know with where the water line is so i assume that that line there is my initial line here so then I can sort of gauge it by eye. Aha, maybe I need to go up a little bit. And it just so happens that that wall seems to be almost level with the line of the edge of the tiles. Maybe just a little bit lower, in fact. So there's my edge of the tiles. And little by little, you see, I can sort of whittle away and get those details placed accordingly. So that's how I would do it. I'll just remove those lines. There we go. And indeed, I, I might benefit just from moving my tape. And I'm not, as I said before, I'm not adverse to changing things, even at this stage, because I can put more detail in now. There we are. So that feels better. Right. Um, does that wall have a bearing on the reflection? Well, that's a question I would ask. It does a little bit, but not enough for me to warrant having to draw a box for it or anything. I should be able to paint it as I go. Okay. And if you're unsure of what I mean, well, for example, do you see that the shadow here that's coming down over the wall, that does have a bearing in the reflections, you see, it nibbles away that shape there. So I can draw that in, and that's a detail that will add extra not just uh, uh, the value of tone but it also adds extra interest into the picture because this diagonal this chevron in fact directs the eye and it's very important to this composition it's a hidden element um, because sometimes when you have um, a way out of the picture on the right which certainly this wall does provide the eye would travel along just like the people would travel along if they were walking here and they go out of the picture and at that point sometimes we lose people the you know the audience who are looking at your painting they, they might go oh okay but with this little device here this shadow which just happens to be natural um caught at a particular time of the day and i was it, and there's no skill in this. It, it was just the luck of I was there. But that just brings the eye down into the wonderful reflections. And that tilt can bring the eye back into the picture again. So that was lucky. There is also another one like that. There's two, two or three of them, actually, which will help. So look for those sort of things in your scenes that can really help. And it also gives you an idea of what to put in and what where to crop. Okay, so I am going to dot around a little bit now because I'm going to um, put that tree into the picture. It's not the most important tree, but it's just another aspect of depth that's going to bring our eyes back. Now, if you were to just do the cauliflowers, like I'm saying here, so I'll just do a cauliflower shape on this mapping here. You would end up with quite a flat green um, space behind the painting. And in this particular painting, 
it may not really matter too much. It might be just enough. But I do actually like what I'm seeing here, this brighter hedgerow of green. I like it because it's, it gives me more depth. And the dynamic of this yellow, this golden green, against that muted sort of earthy green behind, um, it's really quite poetic because you've got warm and cool. So that gives us depth. But also, look, one of those hidden diagonals again here. Do you see it? That's in the shadow shape of that tree, uh, that hedge. So I'm going to draw this one in because it leads the eye down. Maybe you could do without it, but we'll see. And then it allows me to have a bit of fun bringing this warm green into the painting. There we are. And don't forget that that will also lead the eye to this little diagonal. It's only small, but it's so dark that it offers us the opportunity to, we step down from this roof visually, that circle line can bring us to that roof, which brings the eye down this way. Both of these roof lines bring the eye to this little diagonal. And that diagonal does one of two things. It occupies us in this area central in the painting. And there's an amazing amount of busyness in this central shape. We have the little uh, hut, the little workman's hut probably there or cantina. Um, so that will be an exploration center. I think it's got a very nice sort of rustic roof as well. That's good. It then leads our eyes down to the wall, which dips its toes into the water, which is great because all of these elements are leading us down and not out. That's good because then when we finally get into the reflections of the water, by the very nature of a reflection being an inversion of something on the land, a reflection, sorry, um, our curiosity can then go from the reflections and we will probably, if we are very critical viewer of the painting go oh how did this artist do the reflections so we have to do a good job in the reflections of course that which we will do our very best to do in this painting and once we've done a very good job of the reflections what can also occur is the interest of the curiosity is oh is that reflection correct to the building and we will satisfy them on that level too. So we're after um, a very interesting painting here, which may well, hopefully, end up on a wall. So that little shadow leads our eye down to this little area here, the sort of courtyard for the hut. And the, did you notice over here, there's another hedge here, this circular one. So let's just draw it as a circle. Sort of is a circle, really. You know, you're 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 either going to have a circle, a triangle, or a square hedge, or something in that is made up of groups of those three. Um, and it has a tr a tr um a, an angle here with the shadow, that raking shadow again, which is like a step. We're getting steps down all the time. There's a step here. There's a step here. So I'm going to put that in. And these are sort of details, but they're probably details which you weren't expecting to go straight into. You're probably thinking, well, I, I would have thought chimneys and windows are the details. They are. Um, but we have 
much more depth now. This is cascading the eye forward. Brilliant. So I hope that's helping you. Um, there is another one. Look at this one here. I'm not really 100% sure what's causing that, but it, it's because there is some plants like lichens and weeds growing into the wall here. But as the light comes down, you see the sunlight's bursting there on the wall. And then you have this sort of diagonal here. And that's probably the last one I'm going to use. Uh, you can overdo it with them as well. You can find places with so much of it that it, it actually is, it starts to become overkill. Um, but with this one, maybe we're in danger if we do any more. So I'm gonna leave that there. So you have this sort of, you know, like a little flag type shape there now with that triangle. And I'm just gonna draw the wall that's casting the shadow now, because that, that needs to be in. I noticed that the wall also has this little highlight. I really like that. So if I can keep that in my painting and reserve that, it just explains where this is coming from a little bit and also leads the eye nicely to that hedge again, which as you know, will lead the eye back down again, like a waterfall. We're almost there. The, the, the windows and things are gonna be actually not too difficult at all. But here's one more thing that might help. You see that we have this hedgerow here coming down and that will be it. So that hedgerow, its shape is not so important as where it ends and it ends at the edge of that lit wall, you see? So it kind of frames that highlight with the dark. That's going to be good if we can achieve, if we can bring that into the drawing. So just check your drawing has all of those elements. Then as a final aspect, before we go into paint, we will draw the windows and doors. Now in watercolors, as you know, less is more, more or less, <laughs> most of the time. And we don't really want to be going into lots and lots of detail, especially if a brush can suggest it more um, poignantly, which I believe it can in many of these instances. So I'm gonna clear the screen now and I'm gonna just show you how I would draw the windows and doors. It's not the only way, there's so many ways you could do it. And I'm gonna try during the course to change my strategies so that you can get more ideas. But a very good way of drawing these windows and doors is to plot columns. And in Italy, usually everywhere you look, there's a column. So there's a straight line there. This one's a little bit out of the column, you see, but it, there is a column there. It does exist to a degree and same here. These are really very old buildings and things have changed in time. Maybe the windows have moved around a bit, who knows, but there's three columns. So I just start with three columns, one, to and if you stretch this building a little bit that this is your opportunity to rein in a few more columns you can add some if you shrunk the building a little bit like i had initially you can take some away so you can have fun but i've got my columns and now i establish my first window which is it's a little arched window which is fun it doesn't have to be it's not really that important to the scene but for those of us who love arched windows, it's a joy anyway. So we just put, put that little detail in. Keep them all sort of consistent in the, so we've got the columns and then you keep the, the heights in a row. So you could do a little grid. If that's ever been a problem to you before, there is a simple solution to get your windows in perspective. Even though we're looking pretty much at the front of the building, 
it will make things easier. So the doorway is a bit bigger below, so I just make it a bit bigger. And I am not, I, I can reaffirm, trying to copy exactly. I'm just doing, using the, the grid, this basic column and row organization to help myself to get something that feels like what I'm seeing. And there's a beautiful flag there, so I'm gonna draw that in as well. That's a little detail. Flags always add a little bit of color. There's also a flag over here, I just noticed. I don't know if you saw that in the shadow. I'm gonna put that in. I don't know if it if it'll really show in the painting because it's so small, but it's there anyway. And then once I've done my grid and you've got your windows and your door, then just erase that. The scaffolding is gone. And there we are. Wonderful. Now, of course, you're probably thinking already, ah, the reflections, I need that in that grid to continue down. So, yep, you can plot a line down it's a bit wavy so it doesn't have to be perfect you can see that's where my windows will be they'll all be in line so i just take a line down and i'll just put a little line here and there now i don't want to draw a window i just draw a little line because when i come to paint it you'll see that should suffice you don't need, with the water movement, you, you're not necessarily needing to draw a window shape. Just draw a little line. Maybe even just a little square here, you know, where it opens up a bit in the wave. And there we are. That will work. And we're going to move on to the other building in a moment because that has windows. Now, the perspective is a little bit challenging on that one. So I'm going to give you some advice on how to do that as well. So remember the roof line tilted down at about 16 minutes past the hour, something like that. But it just so happens that the tops of the windows are very close to 16 minutes past the hour as well. But look at the bottom sill. It's going closer to quarter past. Why is that? Well, because the bottom of the sill is actually lower down and closer to my eye level. And eye level is always a horizontal. So if I were to think about this as a perspective issue, this line here, which is the top ridge, is going off to a vanishing point somewhere in the distance, maybe there. That's the horizon. Let's just pretend it is for now. So if I take a line outwards, projecting from there for the windows, the tops of the, the um, lintels, they're similar and they would point down to that line too. And if I point them down to that line, you'll see they're actually, it's not quite 16 minutes past, it's getting closer to going back a little bit towards quarter past. And the bottom line is almost quarter past, but not quite, because that also has to point down to the cross, because it's like spokes on a wheel or rays of the sun, the center of the sun being that point, the cross, and it would radiate outwards like so. Hope that helps. Any questions, let me know. So I then just plot two vertical lines down, giving a little bit of space between the windows. And as I said, it, it's a sort of estimated gut feeling that space will do. If you start to think, oh no, that doesn't feel right, change it, make it feel right for you. There we go. So there's my windows. Now, it just so happens that these windows do actually reflect in the water, but because they're darker than the 
shape that they're reflected into, we can just paint them on top. We don't have to worry about them. So just draw two lines that are in line with the column that that window would be sitting on. And the same with that one, very close. If you're out a little bit, doesn't matter, it will still work. But you can see I'm getting this reflected feel to the, the um, drawing at least. Um, I can see where my water line is. It's going up to here, it's going through there, it's going along there, it's then going to there. And you can see now there's a definite feeling of the water where it meets the land and the land that it's reflecting. If you've got that feeling, you're doing great. If it starts to look a bit flat at this point, don't worry, just make your windows feel a little bit more in line. Check that they are in line. They can be out a little bit left and right because the water moves, but if they're out by a lot, then there's an issue. And then this line of the building here, I forgot to mention, this, this side of the building has a, an edge. That's in shadow. This is in light. And then the corresponding reflection here also does the same. But I don't tend to draw a line down like that. I just did that just to guide your eye that it's in line. I tend to do a little wiggly reflected line like that just to to remind myself not to paint a line in the reflection hope that makes sense hope things are happening for you we are so close to painting now we just have one uh, or two chimney pots to put in that little window on the hut there that was easy to put in um, the chimneys now you may well have already put them in well done if you have but if you haven't well done for being patient as well because we're going to put them in now um i just draw a little rectangle to begin with like so sitting on the roof notice it needs a little bit of space between that ridge line uh, sorry that wall plate and the chimney in italy they have these strange little tiles little bees on the top bit of fun now now i put that chimney in i'll also need to remember that the chimney has a reflection and this is more advanced but if i just draw a little shape there for that reflection it really helps notice in the photo it sort of curves it's really moving in the water there so that's if, if you pick up on that then put it in because look what it does it really sort of stretches the Com composition as well that little chimney reflecting there there is a um, another chimney over here you might see another one on the little hut but i'm not going to bother with that one i'm just going to do this one but if you've already put it in fair enough i just think that's enough really probably too much already and this chimney also reflects it's sort of added on there Great. Well, I'm going to um, <laughs> stop the share there. We really have enough at the moment. I'm going to check that everybody's okay. And then I'm going to go into painting. And Right. So let's see if I can pull this over. Yep, that's better. You can see my picture, hopefully, and a little bit of the palette. Yep, most of it. I'll see if I can pull down a little bit get it into focus that's good so now you can see all of the palette um the standard colors tend to be depending on which set you've bought or whatever you've adopted from your kit you'll have a either a cadmium yellow or a lemon yellow so i'll be using that 
that's a cadmium yellow. This is not a standard color, that is permanent rose. But it, the standard color that I use that for in substitute is a lizard and crimson, that's this color here. If you do not have an orange, do not worry, you can manufacture your own orange, but that's cadmium orange and that's cadmium red. Now you can make cadmium orange obviously from your cadmium yellow and cadmium red. If you don't have a cadmium red, that will be very tricky because if you use alizarin and crimson with yellow, you'll end up with a kind of an orange, but it won't be that orange there. Okay, so I'll give you a suggestion if that was the case, but I'll check first because if no one has that issue, there's no point in telling, talking about that. Over here, I have raw sienna. That is not usually standard, but it's the, the um, yellow brown that I tend to use. But in a standard kit, you might have yellow ochre which in this painting would be okay to use. The difference is the properties of raw sienna are more transparent than yellow ochre. So yellow ochre is a bit chalky, um, but it's fine to use for this painting. If in the future though, you could get some raw sienna as an additional color to your set, I think you're going to really um, find it much more comfortable to paint with because it really helps when you're painting with this color here, which is burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is your red brown and it really complements the yellow brown nature of raw sienna. Okay, and now I'm going to go into my greens. Today, I'm really focusing on this color here, which is sap green. If you don't have a sap green, you're likely to have viridian, the dark green here. Now, viridian is a great green to use, but it is very dark and it has a very cool nature. So if you only have viridian, you could add to the viridian mix, yellow ochre or raw sienna, it doesn't matter, Red, yellow ochre, if that's what you've got and you'll make a sap green. And that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use sap green, okay? So there's that, I'm just using one green. <laughs> um, and then my blue, well, it's cerulean blue here, but you might also have French ultramarine or cobalt blue. They're entirely perfect to use as well. I'll probably favor the cerulean blue is slightly, um, opaque but it's also uh, lighter in value but you can make your cobalt blue or your ultramarine blue lighter in value just by adding more water so don't feel limited just because you may not have cerulean yet but I would recommend getting cerulean if you could at some point so there's two colors already I've recommended yet uh, raw sienna and cerulean and a third one would be this color here, which is permanent rose, but you don't necessarily need to get that. Alizarin, as I said, will get by very well. Okay, and then for this painting, you might need some um, neutral tint. Neutral tint, if you don't have it, just use black. You'll have a black in the standard set, but if you could get neutral tint at some point, that would be great. You're likely to have a raw umber in your set as well for a dark brown. I tend to use, sorry, you'll probably have a burnt umber, sorry, in your set, standard set, but I tend to use raw umber. The only difference is this is slightly cooler than the burnt. Both are good colors, but it doesn't matter really. It's going to achieve the same aim, which is to darken and make more neutral the color you mix into. Right, so with that being said, your next stage is to saturate your paints a little bit. I use this uh, atomizer here. So 
So I give them a little bit of a, a wetting up. If you're using half pans, which are the cakes, the dry cakes, I would recommend doing this a, a, a little bit like half an hour before you start and just keep doing it because they they dry so quickly, especially if your room's warm. And the first washes that we put into our painting are going to be very thin tea washes. So I'm going to talk about uh, two aspects of watercolour painting that's not like any other media, really. And that is the paper humidity and the paint consistency. And that's very important in the washes. I also have um, a pot of fresh water there. Some artists, and I would recommend doing this definitely when you're um, getting st started with watercolours, they, they'll have two pots, one to clean their brush and one to apply their wash with. Makes sense. Um, and the last bit of kit, I think, other than the brushes, is a paper towel or a cloth to dry your brush with and to clean your brush with. Okay. So brushes, that brings me to brushes. I have here a hate brush. If you don't have a hate brush, don't worry, I'm not going to use it this week, but in, in the future I will be. And it's um, like, a, or a baker's brush, flat baker's brush. Usually baker's brushes are pig bristle, but a hake is goat. So that's really very useful indeed. Uh, it just holds more water, really, and it's a softer brush than the baker's brush. Although these days you can buy a baker's brush which has squirrel, which is black, and, that, and that's, that's an amazing brush as well, or even ox. But anyway, I digress a little bit. Any flat brush will do, even a synthetic. These are my go-to brushes today. I have, I'm using... Um, that's a Kalinsky Sable, and it's a size 12. So it's a medium sized mop round. I do most of my painting with this brush. Um, I also have a little Sable Rigger, which is similar. I don't think I'm gonna use it today, but if you can get a Rigger brush, that would be great. I'll make a list of these things anyway for the next class, but whatever brushes you've got, you're likely to have a round synthetic like this. This is um, Daler Aquafine, and it's apparently the same size as this one, size 12. Um, they're both really quite good brushes. This one's much better, though, because it holds more liquid. But this one, I, I kind of like it. The synthetic has a bit more bounce in the brush for drawing. And for small paintings like this, it's pretty much ideal. OK, so I hope that explains the brushes. If you've got a fine brush, like a one or two, size two, something like this, you might find use for it today for the chimneys and things. I don't tend to do a lot with those brushes, as you'll see. Um, but I'm not ruling out the possibility I might use it and certainly please feel free to, to use whatever brushes you feel comfortable with making your watercolour painting, okay? Right, I'm going to share the screens now, uh, the other screen, so i just stop that share for a moment. If anyone's got any questions about brushes or any issues that they might want to make me aware of, um, let me know, and I can help you from here, but they should be, you should be okay with what you got, I would have thought. So I'm gonna share the other screens now. Let's see if I can find that shift button. There we go. And so you, you should be able to um, manage 
your screens there. I hope. Let me know if there's any problems with this because I've never tried this facility before, and uh, so it's new to me as well. So you should be able to make that screen as big or as small as you need to see. Just make sure it is recording. Yep, it's recording. Right, so we're going to start off with the tea wash. So for the first wash, I've got two things to do. I've got to augment the, no, sorry, three things to do in one go. So I'm making a large tea wash to begin with, which means plenty of water. I've got to unify the sky or the air with the land and then the water is unified then with both the sky and the air in the reflection. So that's just a complicated way of saying we need some cerulean blue or French ultramarine or cobalt, whatever you've got. I'll just use a little bit of cobalt with a bit of cerulean. And I'm going to paint that straight into as a tea wash into my sky. So you see a tea wash is quite thin. You, you can really see through the color. And I just favor the approach of painting to the boundary, like so. And if if you feel, ah, I could just go a little bit stronger with the color, then do that. But in this wash, we are going to put that sky and its reflection into those locations in the drawing that we've mapped out. That's really important that you... Um, that you follow logically your drawing. And there we are. So there's a starting point. The next tea wash is going to bring the elements of the land close to the sky and then into the reflection. So this is where my raw sienna will come into it because the raw sienna is a really amazing color it can join with the blue of the sky a little bit. It can go behind our trees for sure. So I'm making quite a bit of this because I'll need it. It's in our buildings as well, because you know, the buildings are sort of an orangey biscuity tone. So the yellow's within it anyway. I'll just tilt that so you can see a bit more clearly. Sorry about that. And I favor um, a little bit of a, an approach where my brush darts around a little bit. It, it's sort of looking for marks. And I mentioned that we're after this idea of loose brushwork. And it can be achieved really quite quickly when we're relaxed and in tune with our drawing because you've done really the hard work, 90% of it is already there. And it's, and it's in that um, drawing. 90% of the effect, the strength of your drawing is going to bring success or failure to the painting. The 10% that you then achieve with, and these are just theoretical ideas by the way, there's nothing written about this. But the 10% that you achieve by the addition of colour and edge quality, the looseness of your brush, is the most critical aspect because this is the bit where you add yourself, your style, the personal connection. So you see, I've just added a little bit of orange, cad orange, to that raw sienna and this is now going into a coffee thickness so it's a little bit stronger in pigment and i'm going to bring a little bit of that onto the front of this building because i see it i feel there's some orange in there and i'll also bring a little bit of the shimmer of that into the reflection the difference being though my approach with the brushwork here when i put the um, orange into the building here 
I just dabbed it into the wetness of the previous layer. That's fine. We can get that. But I did it diagonally, like I did with my brushwork in the beginning. But for the reflection, I'm going to keep it going vertically, but not a dead straight line. I'm allowing the brush to be playful and wiggle a little bit in its vertical um, journey. Good. That's pretty close to how I feel it's working in value, but I now need to look, think about the other buildings and they're not orange so much. This one has a bit of orange, a little bit, maybe on this, this corner here. See it just in the reflection. So I just put a, a bit of a, work, a, a thicker wiggle there. But I actually think there's some red in this building and it's this area of the roof, I think that's reflecting here. So that's burnt sienna. So I'm now bringing a red into that orange and look, it gets very deep and much more um, beautiful in, in, its, in its strength of red. It's, it's really interesting. And I drop a little dot of that into that wet pool of orange there, because I just feel that I'm also seeing a reflection of that there moving in the water. So we're just sort of tentatively building up our response into this wet area of paint. Now, if I want to now move along, which I do to this building, I don't actually see so much yellow here. I see more pink. It's like they've stuccoed the wall and they painted it pink. So for this, I'm gonna use my um, permanent rose. And it's still sort of coffee thickness. Now, if you don't have permanent rose, by the way, do not worry. Take some alizarin crimson, there it is, but add water to it because it's a much more um, it's a transparent colour, but it has a staining property. So if I put it on with a bit of water, it's virtually identical to the permanent rose. OK, now I put a little bit in and now what I prefer to do is just squeeze my brush. And pull that colour into the face of that building. So I'm not really adding more. And, and did you see what I did? I only put it in a little bit of an area. And then I let the watery qualities of the first wash move that thicker paint around. And you see it's starting to move and create its own relationship there, which is interesting. Right, that's the pink building. Well, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking as it settles, I could have more warmth at the top there in the overhang, the shadow. So I'm thinking about it, but I'm not doing anything about it just yet. I'm still looking for pinks here and there. Is there some pink in the reflection? And of course, the answer is yes. So in the reflection, I am now thinking about the width of that. And this time, I do want to cascade downwards, straight down in the reflection. But what I would like to do with that permanent rose or alizarin crimson, whatever you're using, is to come straight downwards, but actually use this method, a diagonal going this way and that way to create a ripple. But what I'm also trying to do is to bring it down in a straight line. And I can draw and paint through the windows do not worry about you know you've drawn your windows in the reflections of the windows don't worry about them they're okay they'll be they'll be fine anywhere else where this pink can function yes definitely so i take this pink and i'm going it's going to probably feel a little bit strange but i'm going to put it into this wall here and not just the wall but the reflection of the wall there so you'll see it, it, we now have this zone of pink, this zone of pink, and this here. Now you're probably thinking, John, that's bizarre. That's not even pink in that wall. 
no it's not it's a purple but it's a purple gray but that pink is in there so we can put it in at this stage that'll be fine you can also put a little bit in maybe to that door there because that's going to be a sort of burnt sienna color anywhere else yes maybe a little bit on the edge of the roof here there is a lot of light on that roof but i just put a little bit in and now i'm ready to go into my next wash and most of it is a green the next wash so if you recall i said i'm using sap green but you might have this color here which is like um viridian viridian green if you've got viridian green add your yellow ochre so i've got some yellow ochre and look when i add yellow ochre to viridian I end up with sap green. That's the color we're after. It just so happens I've got sap green anyway, loads of it. So I'm going to use that. And this time I would like you with your brush, doesn't matter which brush you're using, to use this grip here. This is called Maestro Grip, the master's grip. Okay. There's so many different ways to hold the brush. And to hold with the master's grip, you use your um, index finger and your um, middle finger and your thumb. Some people use their ring finger to steady it. That's fine. And you and you just, um, <laughs> it's going to sound bizarre, but you're, I just took a little bit of the paint off because it's a sable. There's so much paint there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to stroke with the master's grip my trees stroking those and trying to create a feeling of um, not volume but tone just tone and i'm going to put that into all of those background trees i'm just stroking this way and that sometimes when i'm thinking about the tree i'm thinking about which way is this tree going so for example if i and there's no rush with this. There's no sort of, um, you know, poignancy of time. So you can be, you can relax with this. But the brush stroke kind of goes to the center of the tree. So for this tree here, because it's sort of a rounded form, I tend to push downwards from the edge. You see that? Like that. And then <laughs> the water just does everything else for you. So follow the form with this stroke. Right, well, that's good. That helps on that level. But now I'm going to go contrary to that in the reflection. So in the reflection, as I've mentioned before, we need to try to feel our way this way. Now, it might well be that as you're stroking your your paint into its space and remember everything that we have up here is reflected down here you might be finding that your uh, you, your your painting is drying down here and if it is then don't spray into this area that is probably fine just if you can either use a piece of paper like so to mask the area that you don't want to spray or as I do I tend to use my hand to to just mask and then I just give it a little bit of a spray and then I'll pick up my paint and then I can start to lay in this wash now for this one I I don't actually think about the form of the tree in the reflection. I just feel the shape and I'm painting, I guess, a little bit of a downward wiggle, if that makes sense. And I tend to use this downward wiggle quite a lot in watery compositions of, you know, with reflections.
And you can't really go wrong at this stage because we're actually only using very light washes of paint. So this is sort of tea to coffee thickness in the green. I can paint that into all of those shadowy areas just to link them in some way if that's a worry or a concern. So for example, here I can paint, be a bit careful. Remember we, we drew those sort of shapes, those squares out and they're, they're kind of our map. So I can paint that green into those little mapped areas only in the water. And then along that line there, there is a few little trees coming out up from the wall. And I, I just dot a little bit of the green onto the wall. Not too much, because remember that when we're painting watercolors, we're actually painting a model. So if you see a hundred plants on a wall, in reality, you may only need to paint five or six to get the feeling of the group. Because if you paint all of them, you'll cramp your space and it will become an issue. I also used a bit of this same color into that uh, shadowy area there that's um, part of the hedge. Right, so that's my first wash in green. And you are, you know, if you want to, on the edge of the, the sort of map of that green shape, you can bring a few little wiggles, but not a lot. The bigger wiggles that you see in the, pet, the photograph come in the darker stages. Right, so now I'm going to add yellow to the green. It's going to get very vibrant. And this time I am going milky thickness. I really want uh, to bring the eye forward. So what I, what I tend to do, if you're using Viridian, by the way, you don't need yellow ochre now. You need cadmium yellow to get this effect. And I'm just going to paint that into this area here. Remember this hedge here I was saying oh, I like the way the uh, shadow brings the eye down I need to add some yellow into the green there you may not even notice it at the moment but later when it's framed you will and some of this yellow green as well you can use and again this time master's grip so remember I'm using a different brush this time but it still works even with the synthetic I'm just going to put a little bit of texture onto the side of that building because there's some kind of um, ivy or something growing up there. And that, that'll look fun. Sometimes it can be a bit too much to paint those sort of textures. But in this painting, I think it needs it because otherwise this is just a bright square could be a little bit um, of a lull. Good, we're nearly there in the first wash. There's a few more tones I'd like to put in. On the roof, you'll see there is this biscuity brown color. Now that's going to be raw umber. But the thing is, if you don't have raw umber, you can use burnt umber. You just, I'll show you how you can do it, but you have to be careful, it's not too strong. So um, let me just remove those guidelines. We don't need those. They've gone. So it's literally this same pool of color that we used on the building. So I just stir that up, that orangey, raw sienna, pinky tone. If I add raw umber to it now, you see I get this kind of golden brown. That's a nice colour. If you're using burnt umber, use a little bit less and then add a tiny amount of either neutral tint or black. Because what that does, I can't remember which one this is. That's probably my black. There it is. As long as you don't make it too strong, 
this will be absolutely fine to start to bring into that roof. And my brush stroke for this, I'm going to use the tip of my brush and I'm just going to cascade with the diagonal a little bit of those tiles just to give it a feeling of dimension. And I, I probably use my paper towel to lift a little bit off because it just, uh, the paper towel adds a little bit of a, a mottled effect, which is really lovely. Um, the other roof here is a similar tone, but maybe a little bit more warmth because you've got some burnt sienna tones. So I add a little bit, so I just vary it a little bit. And I'm going to do the same here. You can see I'm just sketching little diagonals into that. So if you want to zoom in, you'll see what, what I've done there. It's um, kind of like drawing texture. I'll put a little bit on the, the hut. And then using my paper towel again, I'll just dab it on and it takes a little bit on off. It takes a little bit off. So there we are. And one thing I, I like to do at this stage while I'm, if I don't forget, is add a little bit more red under that roof. So I've got my alizarin crimson, still got a bit of pink there because I've got to do it now because I won't have that well later. It's going to get used. Maybe add just a bit of neutral tint. And there you've got this kind of crimson tone. And just put a, a little bit of that under that eave. And hopefully your paint is not wet, is not too dry and it, it starts to pull itself into the rest of the paint there. Okay, that's, that's looking okay. I just want to check and I've got enough orange in these little areas. So I just put a little bit of a secondary dab here and there, just to give a bit more interest into there. Right, and so now we are through the first wash of the painting, We're going into the second. So we've, uh, sorry, third, we've had tea, we've had coffee, and now we go into milky thickness. And at this stage, I'd like to show you the value map. So the value map is, um, I tend to uh, abstract it to five values. So we've had our light and our light middle value. Let me just show you though, if I can the value map. Right, so I'll just move it over here. So you can see here now, this is like a, um, a monotone value map. So it's, it's all in grays, shades of gray. You can see that on the wall, there's a few speckles and window sills and window frames. They're, they're all very light. That's the whitest bright or the lightest bright so that's our first value that's value number one right next to it you'll find then a light middle value which is value number two value number two is where we just had there the pink so the front of the wall there the light orange and then Next to that, you'll probably find, like in the doorway there, value three. So the third value is a middle value. And the middle value is on the roof, it's on both roofs, it's on all the roofs. And the middle values is also in the reflections you can see here. There is some light middle value in that reflection, but it's 50-50 with middle values. On this reflection over here, it's all middle values pretty much, a few flecks of light. So what's happening in the reflection? Well, the reflection will 
filter the light through the tone of the water. Now, remember, the water is probably a little bit stagnant. It's, um, well, it's a pool that they've sort of bridged it in some way. Um, so it's green. So you have that sort of color tone within it. So whatever light's reflected sort of filters through that. So expect in life that whatever's being reflected is somewhat subdued in its tone, just a little bit, just a little bit, and then you'll be fine. Um, and then we have our dark middle value, which is most of the water reflection, you see it? Not the buildings reflected, but the water itself and the trees behind. They're sort of dark middle values. And the trees behind are actually dark middle values too. The last value is this deeper tone, which is those shadows I was talking about, which are going to bring the eye forward. They also give us depth because we've got the full range of values in these areas from light to dark. So the central area, therefore, all of this is going to have more depth. All right. And how does that correspond as a wash, therefore? Well, the first wash was tea thickness. The second wash was a sort of coffee thickness. The middle value washes that we're experiencing, say, on the roof, that's more milky. Then the dark middle value will be sort of creamy. And then finally, these accents, well, they're kind of from creamy to sort of double cream, sometimes buttery, maybe in a still life in the front, in, in a studio painting, they could be that dark. But from 50 meters away, like this is probably about 40 meters away, you're not going to see really, really deep darks. It's not going to happen. So you don't ever really need neat paint, I would have thought, but it will be, be getting thicker there. OK, right. So I th hope that's illuminating. We'll go back to the painting. Any questions about that? Let me know in the chat. Um, of course, there's always a little bit of flexibility in the <laughs> values. We can't help that. And that comes from the fact, usually, that a photograph and it is the best thing that we can use in many ways, the photograph is not really a true reflection of what we see in nature. It's a very, very good reflection of what we see in nature. But um, it tends to put everything into detail and it tends to with the image sensors on the camera, especially modern cameras, they're really good at this. They intensify the depths. So the shadows can be a little bit stronger than they are in reality because there's no aerial perspective in the photograph. We don't get a feeling of the, um, the aerial perspective, atmospheric perspective. Okay, I'm gonna share the original image on my desktop again. I just have to shift a few things around. in my image for some reason. Uh, there it is. So now I just pull it across to there. There we are. And we're going to go into our milky thickness wash now the milky thickness wash will happen in all of the middle er, middle value areas so just check the state of the humidity of your paper now because as we start to come um, forward with the depth the values we're, what we're trying to do is augment the wash into the previous wash and when we've got some lovely soft edges here this wash it will probably not need to be so runny. It will probably need to be um, a medium sort of a broken edge. 
it doesn't necessarily need to be as fuzzy as maybe some of these edges. So with that in mind, check your, the humidity of your paper because it tends to be that the paper can be in four specific states. Although I am told the real, real um, experts at professional levels, they have even further steps than this, but I'm going to um, keep it simple because, you know, watercolor doesn't need to get overly complicated. And when we talk about professionals, all professionals that I tend to know, I know a few of them, but they have different methods. So they have different ways of seeing the watercolor, but, I'm going to give you advice that there's four basic humidities to your paper. There's the dry state, which is where the paper will always want to return to, and it's gradually getting drier by the moment. Then there is the wet state, which is the first wash is very wet. You can see here, for example, in the sky, it's still wet. There's so much water there. But after time, what will happen is it will start to go between the next stage, which is damp. The paper is now damp. I can feel it. You can feel it because the paper is no longer warm. You know, when you touch paper, I mean, just touch your paper towel. It's an, insula it's an insulator, isn't it, paper? It's wood. It's basically wood pulp or cotton um, cellulose. So it shouldn't be cold to the touch, but if your paper is damp or moist, it still feels cold. So I know now that this is in the, the right state for my next value. So if your paper is warm, just give it a light misting. <laughs> um, but please don't feel under pressure because even if you get it wrong, we have this fellow as the cavalry to come in to save us. So as long as you've got one of these, you'll be okay. So I'm just mixing up a little bit more of my sap green and the sap green now needs to be milky thickness. So it's a bit stronger. You can see that now. And obviously I don't mean the color of milk, but you know, milk, you can, if you put some milk out on a bowl for the cat, if you've got a pattern on your, your, your saucepan or whatever, the bowl, you'll see the pattern through the milk, just about. It'll be semi-opaque. That's what we want. And I'm going to add to it a little bit of neutral tint. I think that's neutral tint. <laughs> it's always difficult to tell. And a little bit of my uh, burnt or raw umber. It doesn't really matter. And you'll get a brownie green. It's this um, colour there. And... I'm going to use Maestro Grip again. So we'll practice this one. I know it's a small area, but it's still fun to use it. And this time, as I stroke on the forms of my tree, try not to paint into my wonderful outline of the house. I don't want you to ruin that. But you'll start to see little textures of the, the tree. Leave a little bit of space here and there just for um, the light to, to give you form in your trees. And if you're starting to hear that scratchy sound, it means paper is definitely getting dry again. But don't be perturbed by that, just carry on. And then you can give it a little bit of a moistening, like so. All over, because what will happen now is those colors will start to soften again. I'll put a little bit of texture on this tree as well. There we are. I've got a little bit of background texture in it and it's already suggesting depth. I was careful not to put any on the left hand side of this tree here remember this tree is going to bring us forward but in the water here i am going to start to come forward 
And I can do that by using this brush now to start to weave some ebbs. So I'm going to bring all of these lines down, all of the green shapes I'm seeing are going to cascade downwards, but I might just start to use a little bit of a sideways diagonal. I know that sounds a bit odd, not a diagonal like this, but a, a gentle, here you go, wiggle coming down. See that? Hope you can see that. And this time I can come outwards a little bit further. Now, you have to be a bit um, mindful of the fact that some of the areas in the reflection, like for example here, get that pencil thing going there, that's always, oh, somehow clicked off the screen. Sorry about that. Find the right button. Ah, there it is. We have to, we have to be sort of mindful of the fact that the reflections in the water. If I can get that annotation pencil to work. Look here, that's lighter. That's darker. So when I add this aspect on top of the previous layer, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm really trying my best now to navigate those shadowy shapes that I feel I am seeing. See how, as I came around the edge of that little reflected hut, it starts to create this illusion of depth. And it's all an illusion, but if I follow these sort of wiggly ebbs, and here's a, another bit of advice. Some people do a, fr a smile like that. See a little smiley. And some people also, once they've got that ebb going that way, they might add to it a frown. See that? So a smile and a frown. I don't tend to do that. I have this sort of meandering, impulsive, is it feels to me more like, you know, I feel like I'm going side to side to side, but as I do, I, I close up some of those because if you're doing the smileys, which I call these, they kind of go like that. They're good. They're like the ripples in the water. And then you do the frown next to it. That's a good, it is a good way of getting through. Um, but I, I just find that I can do that, a little wiggle, and I leave a little gap, and, I, and it's intuition. So I can't teach you intuition, but what I can say is try both methods, a smile and a frown, and then close some of them up. You see, I've got a lot of gaps there. Do you see it? I don't know if that's a good thing or not. So I just go back and forth over it and it closes up some and I get a few and it feels better again. There we are. So all the time I am now starting to use textures to create a feeling of the reflection and the original trees too. Now, I haven't mentioned this area here because we're coming to that now when you brought these wiggles down you could also start to bring a few stray ones into that um area of the building you see but it is a model remember it is a model so if you overdo it <laughs> you overcomplicate the model you, you will regret it because there'll be a point you go, oh yeah, I've got it, thanks, that's brilliant. And then if you do too much, you go, oh no, what happened to it? So be careful. And you can always go back a little bit. You see here on the, the, the reflection of this building, I, I wiggle into the, the windows with that green, that's fine. And a few little stray ebbs. 
because we want it to feel like moving water, but we don't want to um, overdo it. I think that makes sense. So there is the milky thickness water effect. Just check that you're covering all of your areas of depth and leaving areas of light. We'll get more depths later, but for now, that should be okay. Is there any middle value on the buildings? Well, yes, there is. So we now need to go back to this area here. So what you'll also likely see is we have, I have five wells in my mixing palette. I don't know how many you've got, but you might likely have five as well. It's quite common. You've got your palette for the sky, which you've used once, but the building you've used already two times, the green three times. Now we go back to the building one, because now in the building one, we want to add more brown so that I'm going to just use raw umber. It's so easy to just use raw umber and a little bit of neutral tint. And I'll end up with a milky thickness brown. That's perfect because I need that just to start to suggest. And, it, and you've got to check that it's not too, too strong. So just check Jen by putting a, a little line underneath the roof, first of all, where you drew the, the roof line. That seems to be okay. Yeah, that's working. And I'll use that over on the other building too. So that's going to give me more depth. And that also follows along. You've got to be very careful on this one, though. This follows along the other side of the roof, which is the gutter. As I paint the gutter on, and I always say, be careful, and I mess it up myself. So I've got to shut up. But I'm leaving the light at the top of the roof there. The chimney, well, that'll need this color as well. So, but this time only on the right hand side, because that's where the chimney is gaining its shadow from. Same on the other one. And in the little triangle. And you notice that the shadow is starting to stretch across the roof. Now, sometimes I have a bit of fun with the temperature on that, but today I'm just going to keep it more sort of monotone in a way. Just use that brown because it works. And I'm looking now for anywhere else where I can find that tone. And I can't really, except for along this roof here. Now, this roof is more, of a, instead of drawing a straight line, which you could do, it would still work. I create a sort of jagged edge just by doing, doing small little dabs in a line, because that then, in my reckoning, and at least, gives me a texture of that old fashioned roof. And now I'm looking for anywhere else where I can see this tone. And I can. I can see it in the windows, but only on the, the tops of the window, the, um, the lintel, and a little bit of the frame. So I just draw some little shapes. If I zoom in, maybe that could help. That's the wrong way. Let's see if I can zoom in. No, not much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this one's open, so when you have an open window, you get a, a bigger, darker space. Now, these windows on the other side, they're different, but 
the doorway has some of that color on the left hand side arch and then i think i've got it that's enough of that because it reminds me that i need to put the shadows in the windows here now the windows here are white and they're reflecting the sky so i need to go back to my sky palette because that's what's reflected i pick up some cobalt blue and i'm going to go a little bit stronger so this time remember the sky the last time i used it was um it was T thickness. So I'm going a bit more coffee thickness and I'll add to it a tiny touch of either purple or violet, doesn't matter, or crimson, or as I'm going to, I'm adding, you see that, a bit of permanent rose and it makes a, a really lovely purpley lavender blue color. I like that color and I'm going to use that on the side of my windows, just on the the uh, left hand side edge of the windows all of them and then maybe just maybe then use a little bit of that original blue that you had mix it in and then you put the blue windows in so i just uh Here, I just have a little bit of fun just dotting in some shapes that could be windows. And, you know, you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be overly detailed. That's the, the thing about it. it. It's a suggestion. I might even put some little lines on the flag. That's good. And already it's starting to feel like there is this connection now with the wall and the windows and things. And maybe just a little bit of that lavender colour along the bottom of the shadow on that roof. I do that usually as well. Because as that blue touches into the shadow, it just cools it. Because that's a cool colour. That's a warm colour. I think it looks like a, a very cool brown. It is really, but it's warmer than that. So... And then just to finalize things with that, squeeze your brush and just soften the edge as you bring that lavender down the building front. I'll bring a little bit of that lavender along here as well. Where else can I use that lavender? Well, funnily enough, I can use it now as a glaze. This is a lovely technique. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint it over that pink wall. Remember this pink wall that was kind of like, why on earth is that pink there? If I put the lavender over that, even into the green of the bush above it, do you see what it does? It subdues it. That's nice. Anywhere else, yes, I, I can bring a little bit of that color over the reflection of the house as well. I don't put a lot in, just a little bit. Anywhere else, yes, I can bring a little bit of this lavender down into the reflection of this house. Now this is gonna be fun because you're going to get to do that little wiggle. I don't know if you saw that, <laughs> do it again. So it's a lavender color. And I just um, started off here. Now you've got to be careful you don't overdo it. And it's easy to overdo it. So ju just a little wash of this. And in fact, it might be better because your paper's probably drying now. You could use Maestro Grip, not a bad idea. And just sketch across the surface of the water near the, you know, the line of the pool there. And as you do that, what will happen is you'll get little ripple effects like that. And then 
a little bit stronger. Again, it's a lavender gray color. And just do a smaller wiggle. This time I will use a smaller brush. And just do a little wiggle if it'll allow where the windows are. You see that? And that really helps. Anywhere else? Yes. And it, it, this will continue that, you know, you'll start to look for these things. But I see that lavender colour as well, close to the water margins there. And they, they sort of come downwards into the water. They dip their toes, but they don't go much further. And they create this sort of really soft, shimmery effect. That's really lovely. Um, and you'll also see it where, like, for example, the reflection of that area there of the wall meets the reflection of the building behind. To push that reflection back, I know it's not really back, it's on the surface water, but to make it feel like it's reflecting something that's back, you can also put that shimmery, lavender color there as well and I, i'm just using the brush it, it's not maestro's grip but it's similar I'm, I'm pushing the brush very close to the edge of the, its flattest edge it's not really what it's designed for but brushes are not just for what they're designed for <laughs> there we go so that's enough of those strategies i think that's working but you know you could play around with that ad infinitum because it will all work. It will all help. Right. So there we go. We've got um, that is our milky thickness throughout pretty much everything. Um, did I put a window? I could just put a little bit on that window there. I forgot about that window. So all the windows need a little bit of that blue gray, a little bit of tone work. Your chimneys are done, hopefully, and the, you've managed to reserve the lights, I hope. If not, don't worry, it always happens. I got a little bit of the green from the background coming into that chimney. I can lift it out. You, you need to use a synthetic brush for that. I'm just using a small um, detail brush for that. Best to do it when you spot it rather than you know try and do it and two days later it won't come out and and then we can go into the next value and what's the next value well oh well we're in the middle values we can start to put in our shadow tone now you've got to decide really what shadow tone you're going to use. Um, I'm going to use probably something towards a purpley spectrum. So if you've got indigo, you could just use indigo. I'm going to use my neutral tint. That's black, so that's the wrong color. Doesn't matter, I'll still use it. It's very close. There's my neutral tint. And if I add that into that blue color with a little bit of purple or indigo, doesn't matter which one you use. I'm going to make it with French ultramarine blue, which is pretty much as close to indigo anyway. And then a little bit of pink. And then I end up with this lovely, very cool shadow tone. It's still milky thickness at this stage. And this is going to be applied everywhere where we've got the shadow. And it's going to be the first shadow wash. Because in natural light, what happens is as we turn from the light, the lights are all of the values apart from the deepest dark. They're all in the light spectrum. But we have the true lights, which are the light and the light middle value, the first two washes. Then we've got the middle value wash, which we're going into now. And it's starting to turn away from the light. 
Some people call these the sort of mid-tones, half-tones, but truly the half-tones are all of the tones apart from the highlight and the darkest dark. So they're all half-tones. So this is a middle tone. It really is the middle tone. And I'm going to put this into everywhere where I see the shadow emerging. But you've got to double check now. You've covered all your bases because there's no going back from here. And I've got a spot here where I didn't put the green in. So luckily for me, I still have some green. I'll just put that in now. It's got a bit of texture to it. So I just fluff in a little bit of texture. There it is. And sometimes it's nice to paint wet into wet. So I'm quite happy that I forgot that area because it is a slightly different texture. But now I'm going to go in with this purpley indigo gray and it's going to go. First of all, I just like to test it. So I just put it over the hedgerow because that's going to get darker anyway. Remembering I've got the highlight on the wall, I'm going to keep that. But do you notice how it starts to bring in an element of depth? And the wall here has a little plant, so I can play around with textures for those little plants. That's fun. I don't have to draw a plant, I just suggest it, and it takes on a little bit of magic. Because we don't know what it is, and that's magic, because we look at it and think, ah, that could be a plant or it could be a texture on the wall, but it's interesting and it's, it's undeclared just yet. So I bring that shadow along and I'm going to add a little bit of shadow. Shadows are always on the opposite side to the light. So the light's raking in from the left above, hitting left above and the front of the buildings. But as the trees turn away from the light, that's where I can add this first shadow tone. You see what it's doing, giving me depth already. I can also bring that along. Remember, I had this shape it deliberately I put in for the um, hedge row there, so I can paint that with that. I like to leave a little bit of light here and there, just poking through because that's fun. I can also bring this color over the side of the building here. And this is where you'll have a lot of fun because you, you start to see that gray and you'll see the potential within it because you could add into it, for example, a little bit more pink. There's some pink and look, lo and behold, it gets warmer in there and that's fun. Or you could cool it down by adding a little bit of blue. And because it's a purple gray, I wouldn't, recommend moving too far away from red and blue spectrum because they're the harmonies of purple gray if you get what i mean we, and the other thing is if you do go from transparent colors which i've used permanent rose transparent i've used french ultramarine blue transparent when when i if i added any other colors to it it will start to muddy. That's how you get muddy colors. If I start to add any other colors, really, other than those two families. But you see there, I could go more blue. Why not? So I could take some French ultramarine blue and literally paint it into that. And as long as I go thicker than what I painted underneath, that's the key, I don't get a bloom. But do you see what it's doing? It's magical. Suddenly I've got depth there. Um, anywhere else? Well, maybe just a little bit of a hint of it here and there, because, you know, you've got those plants growing up again. I don't want to overdo those, but they are there. That's fun. I'm taking this purple now and I'm going to start to put a little bit of it into the trees behind. Now, where am I going with this? Well, you can see the dark shapes that's where i'm going and i i really do prefer to use this as i'm calling it the, mas the maestro's grip in those darks as well 
but there is a place here around the house when I put this in, I have to be very specific. I don't want to lose the shape of the edge of my house. And then it'll start to propel it forward. So I hope you're enjoying this now because what's happening is it's coming to life. It's We're nearly there, ladies and gentlemen. We are very close. We just need a few more shadows on the trees, uh, reflections of those shadows on the water. And then finally, the as we saw at the beginning, the shadow accent is a very small percentage, maybe only 5% of the overall composition. So that's how close we are now. But as you put these cool purple tones in, do you notice what's happening? You're really um, starting to create depth and you can also create textures with this tone on the edge of the, the canopy against the, the sky. You know, you've got that beautiful soft edge. It sort of goes upwards, but now you can also reach outwards and link to that, this cool shadow. And I like to put a little bit of it behind the chimneys as well, because it'll just thrust your chimneys forward a little bit doesn't it especially there and there makes them come to life a bit more and then we can start to bring some of these tones into the water but we've pretty much got most of the reflections of the water now but there are some areas down here for example we could start to bring in ebbs and flows here do you see that that area really against the contrast of the brightness of the wall really needs to have some of that. And also here, where you've got, remember this diagonal leading the eye towards the water. That's good. You might also want to put a little bit of this tone into the windows that are reflected. And that always helps. And there we are, we have our fourth value. Uh, yeah, third value, sorry, done. Now we're going into the fourth. Right, so th this is where we go into a darker tone again. This is the dark middle value. And so I'm just gonna do the same color again, but make it stronger. So this is going to be creamy thickness, so neutral tint mostly. Crimson and French ultramarine blue. And as I said, if you've got the color, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've got um, indigo, use that. And where's this gonna go? I'm gonna put a little bit down on the wall over here, just a little bit here, even in the reflection as well. And the, the sort of brush marks I'm doing now are more fun. They're kind of going to start to give me more depth. And if your paper's still a little bit moist, even that's even better. But to this color, I can add another transparent color as well, and I will. But I, I put a little bit of a dark accent, a darker accent there, so that gets darker. A little bit of this violety purpley color here on the edge of that wall, moving along the water. Probably can't see it because of the reflections of the light, uh, the glimmer. There it is. So if I move that over here. Yeah, I think you can see it better now. I'm also going to use a little bit of this tone to put with Maestro Grip again, a little bit of texture here on this wall. Remember at the beginning, we put a bit of a texture on the light side of the wall, which was um, sap green. This time I'm using the 
same technique, but with the purple color. That's great. That really helps give you the feeling of a vine growing both sides of that building. I'll also put a little bit of the vine on the side of this building. I'll put a little bit of this purple around the edge of that tree there, because remember that was the one that comes forward. That one comes forward and that one's really gonna help us in a moment. And a little bit of the maestro grip texture on the edge of that tree as well. So this tree is now coming forward. It, those ones behind, they're done. They don't need any more. We're nearly there, ladies and gentlemen, but we need our dark accent. We've got everything else, but the dark accent. Now, well, how do we get the dark accent? Well, in this painting, I'm gonna take a risk and I think it's gonna pay off. We take some Viridian, standard color, and just use pretty much neat Viridian into that color you've just created. And we're gonna paint this over the very dark areas on that hedge. as it brings our eye to the diagonal. Remember to isolate your um, highlights on the wall. We still want to keep that. Hopefully that's working. Uh, anywhere else with this dark? Yes, a little bit on that. Remember this hedge, this bush that Leads the eye to that shadowy shape. Anywhere else, the last place. Next to the house, there is that hedge, which has this really dark shadow. And if you put the green purple mixture, purple, it's a violet green, literally, that's what that is. You can't really make it any, you can add more violet to it if it's too green. You can't really go darker than that unless you start to use a black. It's so strong. I wouldn't use black in flat, but this won't be. And I think we got it. I think we have our painting. A couple of dots here and there. And this is the point where you review. And this is where you might see, ah, to get the wall to really stand out there, I go in with my brush, I just close up the aperture around the highlight, which is good. Maybe use some of those other colors just to nibble away at it until you've got it, you know, it really sort of stands out how you want it to. And I just put a nibbled along that line of the wall to get the wall to come out a little bit more. And it's somewhere between that last purple color and the green. It's likely to be a mixture, but I just have a bit of fun editing that to how I feel it must be. Edit this line as well. That needs to be a nice crisp straight line. And if it's not, you're not, Getting, gaining the potential of that diagonal, which is leading the eye. So that really is forceful. That's a hard edge. Here we have a, a mixture of broken edge and mine's a bit of a curve, which is too hard edged. So how do I remedy that? Well, I pick up some purple and that was the dark middle value. And I just dotted around that edge. There we go. And then as a last touch, I just clean my brush, squeeze it, and soften the edge of those two to transition them into each other. And now I have a broken edge. So what that does is it allows the eye to travel away again. It flows, that's good. Now, looking at the, remember we have this very dark line at the edge of the pool. I can just accent that line a little bit with this dark accent color that we have, this purple green, violet green. See that? Just to bolster the idea of where the water and the land meet. 
and that usually is enough to make your painting sing. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording there. I think I got what I wanted. Um, if there was any anywhere that maybe after a cup of tea and a, a little look might be there, just go a little bit, not too dark. You see, if I share the value map with you again, which I will do, you'll see that this area is a darker area in the photograph. But it, it's not really a dark, it's not as dark as these areas that are pulling us through to this zone, um, if that makes sense. So I'm going to stop the share there. It did a little bit of texture there. I don't know if it was needed. Sometimes if you do it hastily, I need a break really to have a look at that. But I think I've got it. I think that's it. Right. I'll uh, straighten that up. And I'll send you a photograph of this finished picture to the, uh, the group. Thank you.